Many of you know John Jacob, and I would say, in fact, he's a hero for wetlands. Uh, this is a man who uh, really is passionate about wetlands, uh, coastal prairie pothole wetlands. Uh, he's uh, the director of the Texas Coastal Watershed Program, uh, professor at Texas A&M University. He's also the board chair of Galveston Baykeeper, which is an organization that we do some work with occasionally. And um, he's here tonight to talk about uh, the value of coastal prairie uh, pothole wetlands, but in particular, uh, some efforts that are going on in Harris County to protect some coastal prairie pothole wetlands, and um, kind of a longer story about the definition of what is protected under the Clean Water Act, and how that definition has been restricted over the years since uh, several different United States Supreme Court cases have restricted what is protected, and uh, how scientists like John Jacob argue that that is being unnecessarily and unlawfully restricted. In fact, there is uh, legal reasoning under the Clean Water Act to actually protect these prairie puddles. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jacob, a, a good friend, to Galveston Bay and to the Galveston Bay Foundation as well. Okay. So, uh, really appreciate that uh, introduction, Bob, and uh, certainly value all the work that uh, Galveston Bay Foundation does and has been a pleasure to work with, with this organization over the years. So, as Bob said, I am with Texas A&M University. I am a professor there in the Department of Recreation, Park, and Tourism Sciences. Tonight, I am here with my Galveston Baykeeper hat on. Now, some people say they can't quite tell when I'm an activist and when I'm not. I can't tell either. But today, I am here officially as a Galveston Baykeeper, as the board chair, uh, full bore uh, activist. But I'm going to be talking about some of the work that my group does uh, with Texas A&M University in terms of wetlands. Now, this is a nice picture that uh, you know is not from around here, right? Uh, not even close. This is Garden of the Gods. Uh, there, just outside of uh, Colorado Springs. So the deal is, when you have a place like this, it's not hard to rally the troops, right? You go out and say, so if somebody was going to put a golden arches there or something, you know, or a strip mall right by, well, you know, people would flip out. They, you would gather them, you would say, you know, that something's happening here, everybody would come around, right? No problem there. We got us a little problem here where we live. This is our garden of the gods. This is our Yosemite, right? This is the kind of stuff that I'm going to be talking to you tonight about. This is what we got to save. I'm trying to rally troops to save this kind of stuff. And you're looking at me cross-eyed. You know, what is going on with this guy? Okay. But this is our place, and our place is like this. Uh, the problem is you drive by at uh, 50 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour. This is about what you see. You know, you don't see much there. Uh, if you slow down a little bit, you might see something like this. Uh, a little more interesting, perhaps, but still not the soaring rocks of a Yosemite or the Garden of the Gods. So still difficult to convince people that this is an interesting place, as interesting as the Garden of the Gods or Estes Peak or any of these other areas that you all go to when you want to go somewhere else that you want to see something interesting. But to the knowing eye, a person who's been here and who's learned to sing the song of our land, this is an interesting place that's on a par with anywhere else. So if you look, for example, at a, an aerial photo of one of these landscapes, so this is what we call a coastal prairie pothole landscape. This is just like that picture you saw a second ago uh, here uh, on the ground. So you can see those little bumps out there. Those are the pimple mounds. You will often people have heard me talking about a prairie pothole pimple mound complex. So the little pimple mounds are these little knolls that are out there. And you can see them here in this photo. The little dots up there are these little pimple mounds, these little knolls on the landscape. The dark areas are the potholes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how those came to be. But the point here is that this is a very complex landscape with extreme variability over a very short distance. So just a few feet, you can go from a convex area, semi-arid, to a concave depression that might stay wet for six months out of the year. So just within that short range, you have quite a template for faunal and floral uh, diversity. So we do have a very interesting place here. 
worthy of our best efforts and worthy of our knowledge and knowing about it. But it takes a knowing eye. You know, it's not like, it's not the, it's not the kind that comes easy, like Garden of the Gods. That's easy, right? That's easy work. We have a tougher work before us because we have the burden of flat land. But our job, the kind of things that we need to work on saving are extremely valuable, as valuable as anywhere else. So here's what I'm gonna talk about here today. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit on wetland definition. Probably you all know a little bit about this. So I'll, I'll go through that part uh, pretty quick. I want to talk about some of the regulatory issues that uh, Bob was talking about in terms of uh, some, re uh, you know, how these uh, Supreme Court issues came up and how, how wetlands are regulated in our area. I'm going to go over some of the work that my own group has been doing, the Texas Coastal Watershed Program which is a small program within the Texas A&M University system. We're based in uh, Clear Lake. And we've had a fairly uh, robust program in terms of wetlands uh, over the years. So I'll report a little bit on what's been lost. We've actually tried to quantify how much we're losing uh, in, in terms of the wetlands. What's left? Is there anything even worth saving that's left on the area? Uh, hopefully I'll convince you uh, that there is. And then there's the question of this nexus. So that's the term of art uh, for the connection between the wetlands and what are termed the waters of the U.S. So this is kind of the big, the big case that's going on right now. I'm going to talk about a legal case that we have going on down in the Clear Lake area that revolves around this idea of connection uh, between the wetlands and between the waters of the U.S. So I'll talk about that. I will talk about the famous Trendmaker case. That's the legal case that Galveston Bay, the Galveston Baykeeper is now engaged in uh, against a development that is going on in these very kinds of uh, prairie pothole wetlands. And then I'm gonna finish up with, well, what is it that we can do individually and personally to preserve the best of what's left? And I hope I can make the case to you that, that the best stuff is actually left. But it's on our watch, it's on our generation that we will lose this unless we can change course. So what is a wetland? Well, there's all kinds of definitions, but the simple one, the one the core uses, the regulatory one, these are areas that are inundated or saturated at a frequency and duration sufficient to support vegetation typically adapted for life in saturated soil conditions. That's a mouthful if there ever was one, but it simply says they're wet areas, right, the blue and they have vegetation that's adapted for wet areas, the green uh, words there, and they have soils that are reflective of that wetland hydrology. Uh, so we, and we have a lot of wetlands in our areas. We are flat, right? The main uh, formation that we live on here, the slope is one foot every four miles. That's pretty flat. So when water hits, it doesn't know where to go. And when water comes down and falls on the land and doesn't know where to go, we get wetlands. So we have a lot of wetlands, and I would say pre-settlement, we had easily uh, 30 to 40 percent of the area was covered by wetlands. Wetlands do a lot for us. Uh, we like to call what wetlands do for us ecological services. Uh, and there are quite a few of them, and I'm not going to spend a long time. We divide them up into hydrologic, biogeochemical, habitat, and food support. And there's a lot of work being done on what, on the, what we call ecological services. People are actually trying to quantify these, put dollar signs by them. It's all good stuff to do. Uh, downstream flood peaks, stream flows, the hydrologic, the biogeochemical, uh, these things uh, do a lot. Uh, to clean water, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go down. So there's a lot of things these, that these uh, uh, features do for us that we can quantify, that we can actually put a dollar value on, but I'm going to argue that there's also an intangible value here. This is our area, this is our place, these wetlands, okay? It's part of what makes us who we are. And I want these wetlands to be here for my grandchildren and their children. And as it's going right now, they're not going to be there. So here's what we see. Here's what's coming, right? You can see it right there. This is a beautiful wetland uh, in uh, Texas, uh, in uh, League City, just off of Highway 96, I believe it is. 
uh, one of the best wetlands in the county, no doubt about it. And you can see what's coming right behind it, right? Houses are coming in. So we've had a little bit of a reprieve with a great recession. Uh, construction slowed down. And now here we go again. We're starting off. And we're seeing stuff coming and going. This is a slide I made some years ago, but it, it would uh, fit today. Uh, California-style homes planned on Texas 88. No bulls in this rodeo. You know, it's rodeo. They don't call it rodeo palms. It's rodeo. Rodeo palms there. Uh, zapping wetlands right and left. Uh, Pearland. These are at least 10 years old. Magnolia, that's all said and done. Uh, this is one that's still going on. This is Bridgelands up off of 290. It's maybe about a third of the way done. They got a lot of stuff uh, yet uh, to go. But it's it's good's going on today. So I just pulled one up that's new right now. This is Generation Park. How many of you have heard of Generation Park? It's a monster. It's 5,000 acres and it is going into an area chock-a-block full of wetlands. This is uh, their advertisement there, Generation Park, going up on the northeast side of, uh, of, belt, of the beltway, of the tollway. Uh, the photo here is, the, is, a, is off of Google Earth and it's the National Wetland Inventory. So this is a map that was made of wetlands that exist in our area. The National Wetland Inventory almost always underestimates wetlands. They never overestimate wetlands. So you can see that there are quite a bit of wetlands. That's, that's, that's most of what this generation park is going into. So those wetlands are history. They will, their loss will not be mitigated. They are not currently regulated. And most of the wetlands that are out here, these prairie potholes, are not currently regulated. They're not, that their loss will not be mitigated. Okay, we will lose those functions. We will lose those values. And I want to talk a little bit about why that is. We're trying to change that. That's what this whole trend maker case is all about. So just to give you the context, well, who is it that's watching the wetlands? There is wetland law, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, that are active in this area. It's section 404 of the Clean Water Act. This is the uh, law that was laid down. Uh, I think it was 1972, if I'm not mistaken, when the Clean Water Act uh, was first enacted. And it gave the EPA oversight over the wetlands, that, that part of the Clean Water Act. But it gave the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers the day-to-day -day, uh, regulatory authority. And the reason they did that, they wanted to give it to the EPA from the whole thing. Had they done that, though, it would not have passed Congress. So that's one of those compromises that had to be made. They gave it to the Corps of Engineers. Uh, you know, they had been active so long destroying wetlands that they figured, well, they would, they'd know a wetland when they saw it, right? They could help them <laughs> make sure. That's, that's, a little, that's a little cruel to them, but uh, there's some truth to that. Uh, so Army Corps of Engineers is the main one, the main agency that looks over, that watches over wetlands. Um, but the EPA still retains oversight. The EPA can, whenever they want, they can come down and say, well, we don't agree with your call. We think you're wrong. Now, they don't do that very often, but they can do that. Then there are a host of other uh, agencies that uh, uh, come in, and uh, they don't necessarily have any regulatory power, but they, uh, they're, I guess you could call them consultative, or they call, actually they call them resource agencies. Uh, they don't have much teeth, uh, both, so there's, there's state agencies, these are the main ones, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fisheries, and then on the Texas side, uh, the uh, Texas Council on Environmental Quality, or Commission rather, in Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Uh, so mainly they comment and they say, no, we don't think you should do this. And there's other folks that comment as well. Galveston Bay Foundation has a very active uh, permit committee, or wetland, wetland committee, is that what you call it? always commenting, uh, and every once in a while they might listen to you, I guess, I'm not sure, but every once in a while. Oh, all the time, that's right. You've changed, that's right. They have completely. Uh, <laughs> all the time. Or else. Or else, that's right. It's a hard business. So, you know, a lot of people, they, they think, well, you know, we've got all this law. It must mean that you can't fill a wetland. Well, yes, you can. How do you fill a wetland? Well, you've got to get a permit. You get a permit, then you can fill a wetland. 
So I, that little dollar sign, I'm not saying it has anything to do with it, but you know, <laughs> you do have to pay. So the core has what they call a little game that you have to play. It's called sequencing. So if you come, you know, let's say you're a Mr. Developer and you want to put in a beautiful strip mall, just happened to be a wetland there, so you, somebody tells you you've got to go get a permit, so you do that, and then the court says, well, we want you to go through a, a sequence. First, you have to tell us that you, can, you can't avoid it. So, you, so what you do is you say, well, I can't avoid it. They say, okay, <laughs> all right, that's fine. And then they say, well, uh, there's the avoidance. So then uh, they say, well, we need you to minimize what you're doing. And then you have to say, I can't. And then, and then they'll say, okay, if you can't min minimize it, uh, then you have to compensate. You have to do the mitigation. So it's kind of like a mother may I thing. You have to go through the, through, through the motions. You have to say, oh, I tried to avoid it, but I, this is the only possible place that this strip mall can go. It can't go anywhere else. And I cannot minimize it in any way, form, or fashion. And they'll say, okay, now you have to compensate. So the compensation system is something called mitigation. So you fill a wetland, you have to replace what you just buried, right? You have to, you have to provide some kind of mitigation to offset the damage uh, that you uh, just did. And so they have what they call these mitigation banks there. Now there's no, I'm not trying to make any illusions of a pork barrel kind of a deal here or anything. <laughs> just in case you didn't quite see that uh, illusion. Um, but this is a, this is a major uh, money-making